All right, so one million cups here in Kansas City. Can we get a show of hands? Who is this your first time right now? That's a lot of hands. Well, welcome and thank you very much for coming. One Million Cups is a program um, that has started here in the Kauffman Foundation by Nate Olson, who is not here this week. He's uh, enjoying some time off. But the premise of the program is an educational program where we're able to host two local entrepreneurs every week, and they're given six minutes to bring everyone in the room up to speed on their startup, what they're doing, and maybe some of the struggles that they're, they're um, facing at the time. After that, we open up for 20 minutes of questions and answers. And that's really where we see the value of us getting together. We're able to connect entrepreneurs with other entrepreneurs that we can all learn from each other. So during that 20 minute Q&A, we're gonna be running around with microphones. Throw your hand up and ask whatever questions that you have. You all have a lot of value and your think tanks up here that we can share and all benefit from. So again, thank you all very much um, for being here. We have another city launching today. We actually launched Delaware this morning, so whoop whoop for Delaware. Also, um, as we've been talking a lot about over the last few weeks, um, we're doing a lot with Dream Big America, and that voting is going on again this week. We're not gonna tell you who to vote for, but Lucky Lou, or Lucky, yeah, Lucky Lou, who presented here a few weeks ago, is one of the contenders, so be sure to go check that out. I think it's dreambig.us, dreambig.us. It does work on your mobile phone. It's not mobile optimized, but you can still do that. Um, all right, so moving right along. Over here in this corner, we have the European Youth Leadership Exchange students. We wanna say welcome to Kansas City, and thank you very much for coming and gracing us with your presence. <laughs> So we also have a lot of other students in the room. We're gonna be acknowledging them as the day goes on. But uh, that's pretty much it for the announcements here at the beginning. Your first presentation today is new to life, as you can see on the screen, with Art Gangel. I'm really excited to have him up here. Um, we, as the leadership for One Million Cups, have tried to give a variety of what's going on in Kansas City. And I think that this is a really good showcase of some of the um, outreaches that's going on. So if Art wants to come up here and get going, give him a round of applause. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, John. All right, good morning, one million cups. Easy for me to say. I'm really happy to be here. Let's talk about Into Life Project. Into Life Project is built on the knowledge that personal growth and transformation are possible. People can change, even those people coming out of prison. Now this transformation often happens it's inside the context of a meaningful relationship. And so we provide mentors to people emerging from incarceration so that they can embrace new patterns and ultimately remain free. Now, how big of, the, of, of the pro, how big of a problem is this, really, in the Kansas City area? Is it really that bad? How bad can it be? Well, nationwide, we are in a prison crisis. The prison population nationwide has quadrupled since the 1980s. What that translates to is in the Kansas and Missouri regions, we have about 38,000 folks behind bars currently in Kansas and Missouri. Now, why should we care? Why is that our problem? Well, because 98% of these people are gonna be hitting the streets again someday. They're almost all coming back out. The problem happens when they come out, however, a lot of them go back in. In fact, in just the years 2009 and 2010, nearly 6,800 of the people who got released in Kansas and Missouri went back to prison during that time frame. This translated to a cost just to keep them behind bars of over $146 million per year. So add this to the already $718 million that it costs to keep everyone else incarcerated and you can see that it is a very costly proposition. Now that's just the uh, financial cost. Obviously there's a, a much broader, uh, um, bigger burden rather on public and social services. 
There's stress on families and all of the incalculable costs that go along with this number. So why do so many go back? What's the deal here? The bottom line is that people learn certain patterns of being. They, they learn how to be in the world. And once those patterns stop working, it takes a long time sometimes to, to learn a new way of being. In fact, until someone really knows, until they've really assimilated a new pattern, they're pretty much going to do what they've always done. In other words, if these people knew better, they would do better. But as we said before, it doesn't happen automatically. It almost always happens inside relationship. So what that means is you need people with time and people who are willing to connect with folks to walk alongside these people coming out of prison and help them transform. In other words, we need to be investing in these people in order for that investment to pay off later. So what do we actually do? Into Life Project recruits, trains, and supports mentors for people coming out of incarceration. We walk with prisoners coming out. The relationship begins while the prisoner is still inside the prison walls, starts with six months inside, and then continues as they get released. Mentors commit to a one hour per week commitment, uh, meeting with their, their mentees, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship. The way we define our mentor-client relationships is that both parties gain, grow, and learn uh, in the relationship. As I said, it is mutually beneficial. The, the mentor, in addition to uh, receiving um, the, the chance to grow right alongside the client, also encourages them, gives them access to their personal network, um, hooks them up with resources they might have uh, you know, in the back of their, in their back pocket, again, reducing those, uh, the reliance on some public services. How are we unique? What do we do that's different? Well, at Into Life Project, we like to say that we're raising the bar for reentry. We basically have two different ends of this spectrum. On one side, you have the justice-minded folks who are attracted to the corrections uh, industry. They're either well-meaning folks who probably don't have a lot of education on exactly how personal transformation uh, takes place. They just want to make a difference. Or there might be one of those folks who are um, attracted to corrections and they're just three steps on this side of the prison bars. It actually happens. Or on the other side of the equation, you have a group of people who really want to help others, but again, are, are pretty much clueless, if you will. Well, oftentimes, people go to help other people with savior complexes or superiority complexes and end up doing a lot more damage than help. And so we are redefining what helping means in that context as well. So this gap that exists here is open for people who are passionate, knowledgeable, professional, realistic, and who knows what works. And that's where we really want to step in. We have a scalable model that we'd really like to bring and eventually like to become uh, nationwide here. And so there's lots of ways that people connect with Into Life Project. We are a volunteer-based organization, so we are always looking for volunteers. Uh, people can be mentors to prisoners. If currently we're, we're only mentoring males, so males at the age of 25 or older are eligible to go in and start mentoring. Uh, we are supported by private donations, so people can invest in, into, into Life Project as well with a recurring donation. We also uh, really thrive on in-kind donations, like uh, events to sporting events or uh, different items that will help create these layers of community that we're talking about. So that's the bottom line, is that we're all about personal growth and transformation. And by doing that, by walking with these clients into a, a new lifestyle, we are also uh, walking ourselves into new levels of freedom. Thank you. And with that, we'll open it up for questions in the room. Julie, do you want to come up? Do you have an extra mic for Julie? Yeah. Throw a curveball at you, sorry.
<laughs> this is so, my partner, Julie Smith. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Also known as the brains of the operation. Uh, we have several. Hello, um, my name is Jack Rooker. I just wanted to know, what's your success rate with this project? We are just in the uh, proof of concept phase, so we don't have any of those uh, statistics yet, unfortunately. Next question to your left. Hi, my name is Dora, and I wanted to ask, how did you get the idea to start this project? And yeah, what inspired you to do it? Yeah, so I have a background in personal development myself, being a life coach for many years. So I've experienced and been witness to people changing their lives. I started mentoring with the prison population about five years ago and saw a, a lack of the, the a, a knowledge and understanding about just how life change occurs. And I also saw a lack of professionalism there. Um, and I just saw how those, those key needs, if brought together, could really create something new. Julie, how did you get started? Uh, for me, I'm a social worker. I have my master's in social work, and um, it's kind of a culmination of several things all together. I myself have not been incarcerated. I don't have any family members incarcerated, um, but the passion came um, just from a concept of understanding guilt and um, how debilitating uh, it can be for people engaging in life and how they walk through their life with that. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Brene Brown and a lot of her work that she's done. There's some great TED Talks. Um, that she's done around uh, vulnerability and shame and those kinds of issues. Um, so I've been on a similar journey that um, she kind of went on as well. And so a lot of that kind of all culminated. And when I was getting my master's, um, I specifically chose to focus on the prison population at that time and um, sex offenders, actually. Uh, but just understanding, just understanding um, the struggles that they go through and trying to function in um, what we would consider normal life and the obstacles that come from that. A question back here in the back. I think this is a great project. Um, are you involved with the jails as well? So since we don't have a prison here in Kansas City that people could, st I mean, this is like, a, I was a big sister. Uh, when I was in college. So this is like big brothers, big sisters, yeah. is a way of explaining it to people who don't understand it. Um, so are, could people in Kansas City start by visiting the Jackson County Jail? And the other part of my question is about 12-step programs. I have a loved one in prison, and just yesterday was struggling, you're not allowed to mail in books or programs, and yet most of the prison population suffers from some kind of addiction. And if they could at least start a 12-step program and even just do step one, I admit my life that is personally powerless, you know, and that my life is no longer manageable. If they could just get that piece in there, but you're not even allowed to mail. I don't know how you're even gonna get allowed to visit people. Yes, so you bring up a lot of uh, salient issues. One is that we are starting with the uh, level of, of prison, actually the state prison. We're working with the state prison in Lansing, uh, working with the Kansas Department of Corrections and their Mentoring for Success program, partnering with them. Now we are partnering with the church this fall who is involved in the, in the Johnson County Detention Center and we're, we're exploring how this might morph into that level. Eventually we would like to be at all levels uh, local, state, and federal, uh, to be able to um, to work at that, knowing that it's going to look very different at those levels. Yeah, the, the difficulty, we actually have a meeting just in a couple of weeks um, for the Johnson County um, Jail System, and just to figure out how we can best serve, because again, that's a little more crisis oriented, or a little, and, and different, some of the situations are different, um, so it's going to be a different perspective that we have to bring into that, <clears throat> excuse me, and then the, with each Jail, as you, especially as you get smaller, you get a little crazier <laughs> in that like each one's going to have their own rules, each one's going to have their own policies and ways of doing things. And when we're work, since we're working right now at the state level, it's a little more across the board. We can work with all the state prisons in Kansas, um, and then hopefully eventually Missouri, et cetera, um, and, and then kind of trickle down into getting a systematized thing that works 
um, and that we can have proof that it works. <laughs> as far as programming goes, you're going to find a lot more programming at the state and federal level. Uh, the problem with the jails and uh, you know, county detention centers is that the population is not as stable. You have people awaiting trial, people doing 60, 90 days on uh, probation violations, et cetera. So the turnover there is, is pretty high. Uh, however, the, the long term or the, the right answer is that there, there should be, ideally, programming at every level. So the, you know, it would be something that the inmates would have to call for, uh, but that the uh, organization, whatever jail or prison, would actually you know, bring in the, the resources and, and run that program uh, for those individuals. Next question to your left. Um, you know, I used to do uh, mentoring to kids when, in, in my early career, but I think that when, as I'm listening to your program, one of the personal or in, internal uh, issues or fears that I might have is when I'm working with someone who's a, for, a current prisoner and becoming a former prisoner, mm -hmm. I think it might be a common uh, internal fear that how do I know this isn't going to hurt me? Yes. How do you address that? Yeah, so we go through an orientation process with our mentors so they know what to expect upon going in. Uh, and then they also go through another orientation at the prison as well. So as far as physical safety, um, th those concerns are, are set aside pretty quickly. I think maybe what you might be focusing more on is the, the emotional uh, vulnerability that it takes to walk alongside someone. And the answer to that is that it's, there's, there's no real um, guarantee. It's a, it's a trust, so it's a two-way thing, and it builds on time, in, in time. It's incremental. Um, it's not going to be instantaneous. Not everyone's going to connect in the same way or to the same level. And um, we can't guarantee that someone is not going to get hurt emotionally, if you will. The good news is, is that Julia and I are there to support that person and if and when the wheels do come off, we can come alongside them, debrief, and help figure out the best course of action. Yeah, I've got several thoughts in my head. So physical boundaries are stressed in both the, the Department of Correction training as well as ours, meaning like you don't meet with them, they, you don't give them, you don't give your home address, you don't, you know, you only give your phone number, you only give um, and preferably your cell phone, of course, not your home home number, things like that, right? So we deal with practical boundaries, but then we also talk about emotional boundaries, and that's actually what separates End to Life Project from other mentoring organizations at this time. And mentoring across the reentry field is relatively new, and Kansas is pretty um, on the front edge of that, and they've been running their program for a year, but even then there's still some shortfalls because they don't they don't really get into the emotional stuff. They don't really get into, um, I don't know, if, like codependency issues and the need to please and things like that that people often cross with boundaries and, and want to give money or want to give, you know, and we are proactive about training about that. We're proactive about contacting the people, our recruits, whereas a lot of the other mentoring organizations just wait for you to call when you're in a crisis. And we, we believe um, very much that people, people don't necessarily talk about those things and they're, they're, they're kind of harder to bring up or they might be embarrassed or unsure or they might not even think a thing of it. They might think it's completely fine and normal. So we want to be intentional about contacting them, asking them some questions, making sure they're kind of staying on um, top of things. Again, as a, social, as a social worker, I went and I have student loans <laughs> that taught me how to help people um, to prove it. But a lot of people think they know how to help and what's helpful, and they really don't, and they wind up um, hurting people. So that's foundationally like why we exist, is to, protect, is to protect against that kind of stuff, but still be of help. Question here in the middle. Yeah, so it sounds like a great program. I'm Dave Winslow, and I, I uh, have employed hundreds of people coming through the system here in Kansas City, but it is at the local level, and you're not really working at the local level, at the the release center, such as the one we have down on Mulberry, correct? Not, not yet, that's correct. Because okay. I see that as being such a huge need. Those individuals are coming out on a daily basis, and, and there is a, an issue, there are issues right now going on in the discussion of this. 
And through my own personal experience over 16 years of working with them, it is a really tough situation for them. Legislatively, are you working in any way to help give them more opportunities? So many of them are limited in the jobs that they can seek, which is a really tough thing for people coming out of the system. And I think it adds dramatically to the failure rate. I think you're right, and that's one of the, one of the tenets that we found at Into Life Project on is collaboration, not just within the helping community, but also within the government as well. Um, we have and business. And business, thank you. And we have, we have good lines of communication with the Kansas Department of Corrections and are developing those on the Missouri side. Um, so the short answer is yes. The longer answer is, you know, it's a process, and we'll, we'll continue to, to develop that. But yes, getting those and other things like banning the box, if you will, um, which is the, the shorthand for removing the, the, the question uh, about, you know, prior felonies. Uh, on state applications, things like that. Those are things that you know we're, we're, we we constantly champion those um, you know those kinds of issues as well. Our biggest role right now, and kind of how we feel like we can affect that kind of the legislative practice, actually, is in educating the community. And so, as we're bringing in mentors, and as they're witnessing firsthand the struggles and the obstacles that they had no idea existed then they're gonna tell their friends and they're gonna tell their friends and they're gonna vote appropriately, right? It's gonna to have to be more of a grassroots thing where people are firsthand witnessing it because it's one thing to just kind of feed statistics and tell people this is what's happening. A lot of people won't hear that or believe it. Um, it and it's gonna be more, I think, through firsthand experience, people witnessing it for themselves, walking along somebody else in those obstacles, being like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Next question to your left. That was a lot of the question I just had. My name is Paul Cooper, and I'm interested in, in employment in the prison population. That was part of the reason why I was here, and then mm. you came up there. Uh, I'm going to assume that that's a big piece of coming back into um, the, a regular community life. Do you know of any public assistance, public funds available, grant sources available that could help employers employ those who are coming out? Um, yeah, yes, uh, in fact, there is a tax break uh, for people who employ former felons. Um, there, as from what I understand, um, the uh, application process can be pretty hairy, uh, but there's actually a private um, organization called The Next Step that can help employers uh, get engaged with that. If you just look at them on, look them up on the web at the next step 99, yeah. the number 99.com. I think it's .com. It's either .com or org. I don't think it's org because they're a for-profit organization. Okay. Basically what they do is that for a small fee, they will actually file all of your paperwork for you and get you access, get you in, uh, listed uh, in a, a list of uh, employers. Database. Yeah, the database. Thank you. <laughs> Words. <laughs> the, well, the, you know, if you if you have jobs available for, for former felons, then you'll get listed there. And what they do is they promote that along among the incarcerated population. So at the, when they come out, they they can look you up, and that's how you get people. I got a I got a question here, right? Oh, can I? No. Never mind. A couple Keep other going. things, real quick. Sorry. There are grants and stuff available. Um, we're not quite at that stage yet. A lot of a lot of grants, of course. Um, how, uh, how do I Are say Strings this? attached. Strings attached. <laughs> um, that we're not necessarily willing to engage in just yet, or we're waiting till we're a little more established to kind of go for those. Um, there was something else. Uh, maybe I'll come back to it. Oh, I know. On our <laughs> Facebook page. Okay. So I, I'd like to talk to you later, but... So with our Facebook, what we're wanting to do is create kind of a... We've got a separate group. Um, it's kind of like a Craigslist for our population. So... Um, what that means is like what I'd like for our mentors to do is to engage on that Facebook page about jobs that they've heard that are available, jobs they've got available, um, resources, just anything from like, you know, couches and furniture and, you know, hey, our church is having a garage sale or things like that, where they can post and, and other mentors can be from all, you know, all around the city can be sharing resources as they come available. 
because uh, that's half the battle for this population is, um, especially if you're working with social services, I can say this, I'm a social worker, it's really difficult. And so, you know, the hours, they might be open on Thursday and you have to get here between this time and this time to be able to apply for such and such thing. And you have to make sure you have these things in line. Like it's really difficult to attain a lot of the things you need when you need them. And the amount of patience, like if, <laughs> if the average person would go through a lot of the um, hoops um, that these people have to jump through, it would drive you nuts. It, when I think about all our tech stuff and how quickly we, we, we get what we want and what we need, um, and they don't have any of this. Um, and so this Facebook link is to kind of help consolidate some of that and to, again, alleviate a lot of the social service burden um, and to get people access quicker to things. Sorry. Next question over here to your left again. I was <clears throat> looking at your website earlier and I noticed that there are a number of references made to um, faith and faith communities. And I was just wanting to hear a little bit more about um, the role of, of faith in this project and whether being a member of an organized faith community, for example, is a requirement uh, for mentoring, and how um, uh, how faith, religion, et cetera, might play into content delivery or program delivery. Yeah, great, good, very good question. So the faith communities around the metro area are our primary source of mentors, but you do not have to be uh, an, an organized, an or, a member of an organized. Uh, religion or, or church in order to, uh, to participate. Uh, we are a faith-based organization, but we are a multi-faith organization. What we do is we encourage prisoners to embrace and follow the, their own faith tradition. Um, so we are, we are inclusive in that way, not exclusive. As far as content delivery goes, that's one of the very first things that we wanted to make sure that we held ourselves to was a standard of language that is not church language, if you will. Um, because really when it boils down to it, it's all about people changing their lives. And so we are embracing what works. And so we, we, have, we are writing every piece of the curriculum so that it can be delivered um, agnostic of a specific uh, faith track or worldview. And then one of the ideas there is that the mentors, as they come alongside people of other faiths, that's another opportunity for them to learn in the process. Awesome. So um, we're about out of time. So the last question that we like to ask is you're in front of about 290 uh, attendees, which is, I'm pretty sure, a record. So Woo. awesome, guys. Hey. Um, <laughs> But what can we as a community do to help you guys out? I know you had your kind of bullet point list of things of how to get involved, but really where are you at and what can we really do to help take you to the next level? Um, I'd say first, first just uh, if, you, if you meet someone who has this background, take a moment and get to know them. They're, they're a human being. Actually take, take a moment and figure out you know, what they have maybe to offer to you. Um, and then and continue to uh, just be aware of, uh, of, of the issue. They, there, there really are these issues. That they're out there. We just don't normally hear about them. Well, I was going to say the likelihood that there's some people in here that have been incarcerated is pretty high with statistics the way that they are. So you're running into them. They're your neighbors. They're all around. They're human beings. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I would also add to, I mean, it's obvious we're, you know, being a nonprofit and we accept, um, need funding, um, that's always an issue. If you have any creative ideas, we're definitely, I mean, we're very open to um, outside-the-box thinking, I, yeah. And so things like that, insights, um, connections, those kinds of things would be huge. Right. Big round of applause for you guys. Thank you very much. So, I know there were a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to due to time. Be sure to hook up with these guys afterwards and um, ask them your questions and engage. They're absolutely amazing. We love having them in the community. I, transitioning here a little bit, have the great pleasure 
of introducing for the first time to the stage one of our community leaders, Melissa here. And if you would give her a warm welcome. So she's gonna take over from here and give you guys your announcements and the second presenter. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Melissa Roberts. I'm one of the volunteer organizers of One Million Cups with these guys. Um, but you usually don't see me because I'm a little bit more behind the scenes running the at One Million Cups Twitter. Um, so please come up and say hi because I love meeting the people that we tweet at in real life. Uh, so first up, we have an announcement from Adam Jones. Adam? Nope, okay. Second up, we have an announcement from Tom Boozer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Boozer, I'm from UMKC. I'm the Associate Director of the East Scholars Program and I teach uh, undergraduate as well. And today, I just wanted to, in, in front of all of you, uh, say, wow, we're pretty international today, for the students from Europe. And I'd like to welcome a delegation of students from China who have just arrived yesterday and will be with us until August 10th studying entrepreneurship. So welcome. And I hope you all, in, in, they'll be out and about town. Uh, if you see them, please welcome, give them a big Kansas City welcome. And, and lastly is, is that in about three weeks time, we open a new building for entrepreneurship up on the UMKC campus the Block Executive Hall for Entrepreneurship and in Innovation. And I'd love to see you up there to, to, to come check it out. It's uh, just up the, about a block south of here. Thank you all. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, one more announcement before we move on from Beck. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning. My name is Beck. This is Nathan. We're here to talk about the Lean Startup Machine Workshop. Um, helping us launch our ideas faster and in the right direction. Uh, Nathan and I did the workshop in May. Uh, the Kauffman Foundation brought the workshop to the Kauffman Labs, and uh, we worked with 40-some local entrepreneurs working on nine different problems, nine different projects. And um, in under 48 hours, the team that Nathan and I worked on, we had a minimum viable product and paying customers. And in addition to that, we had generated over $3,000 in revenue just within that weekend. So it was pretty awesome. And the best part about it was uh, no coding was required with it, zero coding. So the reason we, <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. That's my best, that's the best part. Uh, the reason that we're up here is that the, the workshop's coming back to Kansas City on August 9th. And um, although I cannot guarantee the same results for the second time around for you guys, I can say that you would never look at product development the same way after the, doing the Lean Startup Method. Uh, the event is on August 9th and 10th. It's, it's a weekend-long workshop. And um, for uh, uh, the second event, they are going to discount 10 of their tickets down to $75 from $150. And uh, you, will still, you will still have to sign up. So we're going to tweet the link from One Million Cups and the Facebook page. Um, also, you'll make sure to use the promo code one MC or one million cups to get the discount, and hopefully we'll see you in August. And Nathan has something to say. So, what's great about Lean Startup Machine is it's a system, a process over a weekend where you actually dive in, take an idea, and decide before you go and raise money, before you go and develop a product, do you actually have a customer? And so, it's a great way to find out if you have something in the first place before you go through all the hoops of starting a company to find out that it's going to fail. Get your customers first, and then go and build out your, your business. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks. So I have the great pleasure of introducing our second speaker today. Um, Stephanie Sharp is a really impressive woman. She's not only an elected official in Johnson County, um, but she's also revolutionizing the way that candidates for elected office and issue leaders uh, think about building relationships with their constituents. So please welcome Stephanie Sharp. Hey. I, I'm really excited to be here today, and I especially want to thank Into Life for providing a great segue. Nothing like recidivism and then talking about politics, right? None of my clients, of course. Uh, I grew up in Garden City, Kansas. A little bit of background about me. It's about six and a half hours southwest of here. Is anybody from western Kansas? Nice. For the rest of you, that's that vast, uncharted territory west of Lawrence. Um, <laughs> I went to DC for grad school, and um, we, where we knew every single touch 
that a voter received. It was email, it was phone calls, every single letter, and it was my job to write letters to explain my boss's position. So we knew a lot about our, our um, voters' relationship before we, we made those contacts. I came back to Kansas City, and nobody really cared about a in fancy international relations degree, except for welcome to the, to the visitors we have today. Uh, but I had political, <laughs> bonjour, buongiorno, guten tag. Um, I, I did have a lot of political experience, and so I started lobbying. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, it's, not, it's not exactly what you think. I hear some lobbyists in the room. Um, my, I, I had three grandparents, an aunt, and my dad who had all had cancer. So I lobbied for the American Cancer Society. And after a couple of years of lobbying, I was recruited to run for the Kansas House of Representatives. And at 26, I uh, was sworn into the House, and they have you come to Topeka. I turned in my lobby badge, and I raised my right hand to uphold the Kansas Constitution. And they said, OK, good luck. And I was left completely to my own devices. There was nothing from the day before, let alone the decade before. So I started, um, basically, <laughs> I, uh, one second. Um, I was young and cheap, and I started an email newsletter to start communicating with my voters. And as it turns out, I was pretty good at uh, helping explain uh, complicated political jargon and processes to people in a language that they could understand. You've all been there. You've heard politicians and lawyers. They like to talk up here because they think it makes them sound smart. And really, it just frustrates people. Words like germaneness, conferenceable, call of the house, etc. cetera. Um, I call it translating politics into English, oops, I forgot to switch the last line. I call it translating politics into English. And uh, guess what happens when you email thousands of voters in, about politics in a language that they can understand? They reply to you a lot, which is great if you're in DC and you have the staff and the systems and the databases to help you respond to those people in a knowledgeable way. State and local officials have nothing. There are no tools that exist. So I literally started a spreadsheet. I took my voter list that was in Excel, and I added about a dozen columns to be able to track what I've said to which voter and what is going on in their world and what my relationship is with them. Guess where that spreadsheet was when I ran into somebody at the grocery store or at a networking event like One Million Cups? I had no way to jog my memory about my relationship with this person because it was stuck in my computer. Or when I'm walking door to door, you're cold calling, basically. Unless there's a Mother Mary statue in the front yard or bumper stickers on the car, you know nothing about that voter. So you're gathering all this data, especially door to door. But have any of you done door to door campaigning? You gather a gold mine of data. And then at the end of the day, in July in Kansas City, you're supposed to go back to your computer and enter in all this information that you have about voters. This are, these are actually files that are still in my garage. And that gold mine just sits there. It doesn't ever actually happen. So when I started my own business, I realized that I had the flexibility to create a solution to a problem that I was uniquely qualified to solve. Because of my experience in DC, communicating with voters, with lobbying, communicating with, with cancer volunteers, being in the House, and now on the JCCC board, the technology exists to take that spreadsheet and make it more robust, mobile, and pair it with GPS location data. Introducing VoteSharp. VoteSharp is a CRM that sits on top of the public voter registration database and allows you to manipulate that data in a way that is helpful for the candidate, as well as track communication and micro and macro target that communication. I buy the list about four times per year. Again, it is public information. I know where you voted, I know when you voted, I know who was on your ballot, but I, contrary to popular belief, I do not know for whom you voted, although that would be really handy. So if you want to tell me, just um, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> um, so this data, I'm going to move over to the web app here. Uh, one second. Where's Pam Curtis? Is Pam here? Thank you, Pam. Uh, many of you know Pam uh, from her time at uh, Wyandotte County KCK. She was instrumental in bringing Google Fiber to Kansas City. And I want to show you her file in the web app. I don't know how many of you can see that. This is her public information from the Secretary of State's office, the last 12 times that she's voted. 
all of her demographic and representative information. I'm going to go to contact information and add in her email address. I saw her last week at 1 million cups. I'm going to go to a contact file and add in, I saw Pam at 1 million cups and she complained about the gas tax in Kansas. Now I'm also going to tag this communication with taxes opposed and transportation so I can tie that contact to broader topics to be able to hit her later. My favorite part is email. I was so sick of digging through my sent mail to look for the last time I had talked to someone, what their issues were, what was going on in their life to make a relevant response. Now, all I do is I reply to the constituent, I CC myself, and the entire text of our conversation is added to their voter file. In addition, all of the notes I just showed you, those are all keyword searchable as well. Okay, so let's say um, the legislature goes and reduces the gas tax. I'm going to do a, a keyword search for gas and find everybody who contacted me specifically about the gas tax. I'm sitting on the House floor and I'm going to zip them an email, hey, just wanted to let you know that the governor just signed this gas tax reduction. Thanks for contacting me about it. Let me know if you have any questions. Instant, up to the date, exactly on the issue that they contacted me about. Now, on the flip side, let's say John Doe contacted me a couple months ago about income taxes. He's tired of income taxes. So I, I tagged his communication with taxes opposed. So I'm going to go to the app and I'm going to look for all of those people who are opposed to taxes. And I'm going to zip them an email that says, hey, wanted to let you know that we just reduced the gas tax. They didn't contact you specifically about that, but you can get them on an issue that's close, that's right in their wheelhouse. Oh, by the way, oops, what happened? Aha, there we go. Um, another, another quick thing that you can do with this, like let's say I'm looking for Republican men over the age of 65 who are anti-tax. I can search all of that, date of birth, age, gender. Is that funny? Is there something funny about that? Awesome, I was gonna say it's all <laughs> I have a good crowd this morning, thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm going to move over to the mobile app, which is uh, my husband's favorite, just anecdotally. Let's say I am walking door to door in Pam's neighborhood during the 2014 general election. No whammies. Actually, that's okay. about seven minutes worth of presentation oh. time, so we need to open it up for questions before we get too much further. But okay. Somebody ask a question about the mobile app. <laughs> That's a question about the mobile app. I'm sorry. Um, question over here. Hi. I think it's a great idea, and there's a lot of value to this, extreme value to what you're putting together statistically. But I see a lot of uh, concern, extreme concern, when we're looking at the PRISM project, when we look at the feedback sure. from the Instagram collecting people's data. Right. How do you address that or overcome that stigma. Sure, great, que great question. The, uh, all of this data is publicly available. You may not want to know that. Um, your, uh, your address, your phone number, your date of birth, all that information is publicly available. Um, the rest of it is simply data that you are developing about your own relationship with people. So um, I had 22,000 constituents as a state representative and they had one of me. So I wanted to be able to remember my relationship with Ray Mackless and, and David Vickers and all these other people, but I needed that mental trigger. So it's your own, it's basically cataloging your own personal relationship. Nobody else has access to this data within the system. Now, if I want to give um, a secretary, a, an administrative assistant at the Capitol, access to be able to put in data about somebody who comes to visit me at the Capitol or um, on the JCCC board, there's limited access that you can give other people to add data if you're walking door to door and you have people walking with you, et cetera. Question on your left. Hi, uh, I'm a Hispanic marketing consultant and Hispanic consumers and voters are becoming more and more important, especially in voting. Um, does your uh, work have anything to tap into that or utilize that or? How do you guys address that for your business? Yes, so that takes money, which I'm still working on. Uh, right now, all the data that's in the system is location data and voter registration data. So I would like to add in um, uh, religious information, what, affiliate, what religious affiliation people are. You can add in, you can buy data that says the, um, 
the income level of the home, how many computers, how many kids, race, uh, things like that. So there's all kinds of other data that we can add into that. And that's certainly something that, that I've, I've considered. I haven't actually considered race because I don't think about separating, I guess, um, in that way. But um, that's certainly something that we, could, that we could add in. Next question, back in the middle. Hello, how you doing? Good. I have a question about your system in comparison to the BAN system. Right. Uh, I know Kansas doesn't use it a whole lot. Um, so can you explain to me kind of the difference in those two? Good question. OK, so for, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, uh, the Democrats use a system called Vote Builder and Mobile Van. Um, it's the sort of the mobile side of Vote Builder. And I met with a lot of people before doing this just to make sure I wasn't reinventing the wheel. And what I've seen from Van is, is two main things. It takes a couple of day training to figure out how to use it. Um, and God bless my developer, when I, um, when I was working with him, I said, I need you to write this so that a 65-year-old white-haired man isn't going to be intimidated by it. And I feel like the search function is very intuitive. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second is um, uh, Van is very top-down, where the party feeds you the information that, that they know about this voter. And mine is very bottom-up. It's my grassroots relationship with somebody um, you know, one thing that I've um, often talked about is I want to be able to send somebody a note because I remember that their mom was in the hospital last week, but I can't remember who it was. So I'm going to go in and keyword search hospital and zip them a quick note. So it's that kind of a my relationship with this voter. And then also that information is, is mine and mine only. So if I want to share certain aspects with, say, my state senator or my city council person, I can do that. But it's not, uh, when you put information into Van, the entire party gets it. It's not, um, it's not your proprietary relationship, which I think is, for me, if I was going to spend the time walking door to door and meeting all these constituents, I wanted to develop real authentic relationships out of it, too. So I didn't want to share all that information with, with the world. So that's, those are the two main differences. Over here on your left. I have two questions. One. Um, so you go network, you go knock on the doors, you meet people, and you put all the information into your app. Right. Can I download that information and find out what my next door neighbors are voting for and what they're interested in and what they care about? No, you can't download that information. Now, you can look up. It's pretty easily accessible. Um, you can look up your neighbor's voting record, sure. Okay. That's pretty easy. So unless I was running for a government official position, do I have use to download the app? Yes, actually, um, I was going to mention, if, um, it, it is on the App Store. Now I have to give you a demo account. So if, you, if you're interested, email me, and I'll set you up with a demo account so you can look. All it is is, is the data. There's, no, there's nothing populated in there. But you can nose around and see if your neighbors or your bosses vote. You may not want to know. It's kind of depressing sometimes. Um, but it's not publicly. Uh, your notes about some, your, your relationship with somebody is not publicly accessible. Question here in your middle. I guess mine's more of a comment, and I think what I uh, what I see this is is really a contact relationship management for the politician. It's a private right. piece of software for the private. Thank you. Yes. Right. That, that's yes. what you're. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add on to that a question. So I'm I'm the software development side of things. Talk to me a little bit, or talk to the room about how you actually got this built. You said you mentioned your developer, which usually they don't get mentioned, so kudos to him. Right. Um, uh, you mentioned your developer. Talk about the process of actually, this is very robust. How did you actually get it built? Uh, well, I, most of my friends and my clients would consider to me to be pretty techie. And I don't know why this isn't coming in. There are usually really cool pins dropping. Uh, and I would consider myself to be techie on the consumer side. I know what I want. I know what I need. And I, in my role in all these different places in DC and in Topeka, I knew what I wanted conceptually. And so it was a matter of, of interviewing developers, getting a couple of good recommendations, and sitting down with somebody who said, I think I can do that, and here's what I would do. And he talked in a completely different language. Um, kudos to those of you who can translate that language. Um, developers are just these brilliant people. Anyway, um, and so we just sat down, and we went through a couple of iterations, and I put together, well, a, to back up a little bit further than that, I put together a focus group of 
state representative, state senator, city council, or school board, the state and local officials that I really wanted to target this to because they don't have the resources. Um, and I said, what, what would you use in something like this? What wouldn't you use? What would your priorities be? And we rolled out the first iteration, and they looked at it and, and critiqued it. And we did a lot of um, step by step just to make sure, again, that I wasn't developing something that no one would use, and I wasn't reinventing the wheel. Does that answer the question? Question here in the back. So an issue in my neighborhood is not just voting, but just getting voters registered, period. Right. Is there a way to use your data to look at a neighborhood and say who is registered and who isn't so that you can target voter registration drives? Uh, yes. So um, and I, if, if this would pop up, I don't know why it's not popping up. Um, I don't know if it's not we're connecting to the internet. But um, a, a good example is, um, this is kind of TMI, but we're looking for a new house, and we want a neighborhood with a lot of kids. So I use the app. We sit in front of a house that we like, and I look at the dates of birth of the people who live around. And if there, if there aren't pins dropping out of the sky, it means there's no one registered to vote in that area. I do the broadest search that I can do. Uh, do a, I'll look for Republicans, Democrats, and unaffiliated voters voting in one of the last three fall general elections. I mean, that's, you know, hits two um, presidential elections. That's a pretty big search. So then if, you, if, if, if the pin isn't dropping on somebody's house, it means they're not registered to vote. So you would be able to tell where people are and aren't registered. Um, or you could look them up and see if their name pops up or, or doesn't. Um, and there are going to be blocks of, I'm going to need to log in. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, we're having um, mobile troubles. Other questions? Question in the middle. Yeah. So my question is, who pays for this? Who buys this service? Because you can obviously imagine you need it for campaign purposes, you need it for legislative purposes. Obviously, in Congress, you know, they have the franking privilege, so you know, U.S. mail is free. Is it the party? Is it the candidate? Is it the campaign? Is it the legislature itself? Excellent question. So at the federal level, they have tons of money and, and, and tons of resources like this. They have big flashy programs. I went much more for function over fashion. Um, so this isn't really targeted at them. This is the, the grassroots, the door-to-door the -door folks. So um, you can pay for it out of your campaign funds. I would love to find a state that would use this. I mean, it obviously makes sense from a state perspective, but very few states are going to be willing to, to, to do something like this. Um, it's just not. States are strapped, so they're probably not going to pay for it. But they can pay for it out of their, um, sorry, candidates pay for it out of their campaign funds. Question and here I, in the back. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, um, I charge $700 a year um, for the data, and that includes all of the upgrades and updates. And um, like I said, I spend um, at least $1,000 every year on data, keeping that voter data up to date. Okay, question here in the back. I remember when I got your first email from the floor of the Kansas House, and I thought, I didn't know anybody in Topeka knew how to use email, or was that even legal? So now we've switched to people are using more texting, and they're only checking their email maybe once a day. Are you collecting the text numbers, and has Brian Newby allowed that as an opt-in? for his database that then you buy? I don't think they would allow that, <laughs> sell that information, but part of the voter file is phone numbers. Now, um, most people will give a home phone number, and when they change their address, they won't, or, or they get rid of their landline, they're not gonna update their voter record. So the phone numbers aren't all that helpful, quite honestly, because people are ditching their landlines more frequently. Um, Texting has not, that's not something, that, I have talked to Phone to Action, Jeb at Phone to Action, and talked to him about some of that side of it. Um, I think people, I think email is still very powerful. Uh, if you con consider how often you check your email a day versus how often you check your Facebook and Twitter, and you know, your email is right there, it's constant, you're constantly deleting all the crap and um, reading the good stuff. Are we ready to take a look? Um, so, uh, so far the texting is not something that we've, wor we've worked on. Facebook and Twitter, I do have the ability to keep, uh, to track your information, um, to track that information for future integration. But right now, quite honestly, there isn't the demand um, for uh, not enough 
I mean, this, that, that's the demographic here. Not enough um, people on social media vote regularly enough to, <laughs> to, to make the, the, um, that, that side of it work. And so now, as you know, I, I run campaigns for free to defeat tax increases. And so can I build a mailing list from your database that's better than what I can buy from the election board? Absolutely. Uh, so the other side of the app, there are kind of two sides of it. Let me get to Pam, back up to Pam's house here. Um, one second. There we go. Uh, so, so the other side, there's another search function on the app that is really uh, just for candidates developing lists. You can develop mail lists, walk lists, and communication lists like yard sign locations and things like that um, with another set of uh, searching on the app. And uh, let's see. Oh, it's, it's hooked up to the mobile. I can't show you right now. Um, but you can do that based on one set of elections or two sets of elections. So if I want to uh, pick hardcore voters who voted in two of the last three fall primary elections and two of the last three spring primary elections, that's your hardcore voter, I, I can export that list and give it to a volunteer to do phone calls or door-to-door -door or something like that. And, and a lot of times um, there are older, voter or older volunteers that don't want to walk doors with a mobile device. And so you can export that list that they can use. And then, again, you're stuck at the computer entering in all that data at the end of a walk day. Next question right here. Hey, this is great, Stephanie, having you know, canvassed uh, and hit the street uh, using other software. You know, this is very functional and related to the constituency. I was just wondering uh, whether you know, other CRM kind of packages like Salesforce.com might not have built something like this, or have you looked at that? They do, they, and I, I looked at that too, and they have Campaign Force. But again, um, it is developed for big campaigns where you're managing dozens of volunteers, um, collecting millions of dollars. There's all these different parts of it, uh, collecting millions of dollars in donations, um, and you're managing great big lists and lots of data, and it's really expensive. So uh, state legislators and local legislators who spend, well, especially, um, city councilors, school board members who spend a couple of hundred dollars, usually out of their own pocket, on a campaign, they don't have the huge, you know, millions of dollars to spend on that kind of stuff. So I really wanted to develop something for the demographic that I knew, that I knew that needed the help in an affordable way. And the $700 is actually for a house account, and it gets cheaper as is, like city council and school board, the smaller races. Um, I'll show oh. you. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to, I'll show you real quick. You saw, you know, the, um, the fly-in with the, with the uh, so I'm coming to Pam's door. I look at her record and I see that she's interested in, you know, reducing the gas tax. I see all of that's in the cloud and then, then it makes it um, mobile. So I see her history here, things like that. So that's, that's just what the, the mobile takes all of that um, personalized data about the, the voter and makes it, puts it on the map for you. Wonderful. So the one million cups question, yes. how can we help you? Great. I didn't get to this. <laughs> um, so the question, what you can do, all of you know elected officials or you know people who work for elected officials and, um, and, and they can obviously benefit from this, but you're also familiar with organizations. This is great for groups of organizations who work with voters at any level. Uh, neighborhood organizations, uh, nonprofits, things like that, that could use voter information. Let's say you have a coalition of groups and all of you have various information about voters, put it all into one data source so you can all have access to that information in one place and, and macro, micro target and track communications. Um, there we go, and that, that's, the, that's my contact information. And um, thank you for your time, I really appreciate it. Again, um, it's on the App Store and email me for a demo. Thank you all very much, and thank you again to the Kauffman Foundation for hosting us and letting us use their space. It's been another great week.